Welcome to Who's in STEM. I'm Ken Ono, your host and the STEM advisor to the Provost and the Marvin Rosenblum Professor of Mathematics at UVA. Our goal is to evoke flights of imagination and wonder by showcasing the cornucopia of all that is STEM at UVA, the marvelous world of UVA science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, today we're talking about an insidious epidemic that affects more than one in nine people aged 65 and older. It's projected that 13 million Americans will be afflicted by 2050. This disease is stealthy, sneaky, and deadly. And, well, it's a disease that's marked by loss, many losses. The loss of memory, the loss of the ability to reason, the loss of the ability to understand speech, and ultimately the loss of life. Talking about Alzheimer's. Many with the disease are unaware of their mounting losses, often living out of sync with reality. Furthermore, family, friends, and caregivers become secondary patients. I'm sure that many listeners will understand firsthand the physical and emotional burden and the depression that is the price of one's devotion to a loved one. My wife, Erica, and I, we are among them. And on top of all of this, is the sad reality that Alzheimer's is extremely difficult to diagnose. It's a pleasure today to speak with a pioneering crusader who is leading the charge to understand Alzheimer's. Professor George Bloom here at UVA, Dr. Bloom, is on the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences, the faculty of the medical school, and is a lead researcher in the UVA Brain Institute. He is an award-winning scholar, For example, he's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. George, welcome to Who's in STEM. Ken, thanks very much for inviting me this morning. My pleasure. This is this is a difficult topic. I think I think it will speak to many of our listeners. So, George, let's 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 just dive in. For non-experts like me, even though I have family members that have been diagnosed and are presently struggling with Alzheimer's, for non-expert. What is Alzheimer's? Well, uh, I think at at the behavioral level, uh, most people have a pretty good understanding. It's a loss of cognitive skills and everything implied by that, Uh, especially loss of short-term memory. But as the disease progresses, uh, the ability to analyze information in a reasonable way. So at a more biological level, uh, we have to – it it may be worth spending a, a minute or two describing the uh, sort of cellular basis of cognition. So in the human brain, there are about 86 billion neurons. Uh, Many of those are involved one way or another in cognition. Some of them are probably not. But a good chunk of those those neurons influence cognition. Mm -hmm. And the way that happens is that they're arranged in neural networks. So each neuron makes anywhere from about 1,000 to 10,000 connections with other neurons. Hmm. Uh, And so we have this this intricate circuitry that's kind of the biological equivalent of a integrated circuit that runs a computer or or a cell phone or any one of the numerous kinds of electronic devices that we're all so familiar. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. orders and orders of magnitude more complicated than anything we've been able to produce so far, notwithstanding advances in artificial intelligence and 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 data analysis which and which I came mach- first right? yeah which yeah. machines can sometimes do faster than humans but anyway these connections among neurons are called synapses and despite all of the controversies that still exist in in alzheimer's disease research uh, there's a couple of things that that everybody agrees on and perhaps foremost is the fact that the symptoms of alzheimer's disease are caused quite simply by two things. One is the malfunctioning and loss of the synapses that mediate cognition and memory uh, and the death of the neurons that make those connections. Mm -hmm. And perhaps one of the most interesting and insidious things about Alzheimer's disease is it's not like many other diseases, COVID, for example. You can wake up in the morning without COVID, and by the end of the day, you've got an active COVID infection, although it may take a few days for you to know that. Mm -hmm. Right. By the time someone is symptomatic for Alzheimer's disease, that marks the end of a process uh, that's been going on for 20 to 30 years, where 
under the hood, behind the scenes, biological processes that, that are leading to synapse decline and neuron death are taking place. And the brain is, is, is amazingly resilient. It can withstand an awful lot of damage and still function uh, at near 100% capability. But at some point, you reach a precipice right, a and you lose one right. more synapse or one more neuron. And then the cognitive decline uh, that we're all familiar with in Alzheimer's disease is underway. And uh, average lifespan at that point is about five years. Mm. And so if and when we solve the problem of Alzheimer's disease, it's going to be a two-pronged attack. Mm -hmm. One is early diagnosis, identifying people who are at risk of becoming symptomatic many, many years, decades, 10, 20 years, maybe even longer before symptom onset. Uh, and then we need to intervene therapeutically in an effective way. That therapeutic right. intervention could involve lifestyle adjustments. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you like bacon double cheeseburgers, fine, but don't eat them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every right. day. Right. Uh, exercise, sleep. But I'm pretty convinced that it's going to require drugs also. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good news is that half of that equation is, I think, arguably solved. You had mentioned earlier, Ken, that very difficult to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that is not so much the case anymore. Things like PET imaging and looking for biomarkers in cerebrospinal fluid, which requires a spinal tap, and most recently, blood tests. Let's talk about that. As I have understood, and please correct me if I'm wrong or if the science has changed a lot recently, but I've, I've always thought and heard that properly diagnosing Alzheimer's is a post-mortem test. You have to die before you can be absolutely sure that a patient had Alzheimer's. Where are we today in terms of diagnosing living patients? And why does it matter? Well, um, your statement would have been correct uh, up to about a dozen years ago. And in practical terms, it still applies in many cases uh, because people who you know, are shown to have had Alzheimer's disease when they passed away might not have had the benefit of any of the recent diagnostic advances, in which case autopsy would be required for confirming that Alzheimer's disease was happening in their brain. How would you measure or detect synapse failure? Well, we can't really detect synapse failure directly, okay? But what we can do is there's now a group of, of diagnostic tools that can be used individually or in combination mm -hmm. to identify people who are likely, when I say likely, I mean 95% chance of being symptomatic for Alzheimer's disease a fixed number of years after these tests are made, okay? And I think it's fair to say that accuracy now extends 15, 20 years before symptom onset. The first big development was PET imaging for mm -hmm. uh, amyloid plaques, which are one of the abnormal structures that builds up in Alzheimer's brain. Personally, I don't believe that the plaques themselves are the cause of the dementia, but they're mm -hmm. certainly a marker of a diseased brain. And, mm -hmm. and in that sense, monitoring them is very important. Coincidentally, uh, one of the persons who was instrumental in bringing PET imaging for plaques mm -hmm. to the diagnostic forefront was Steve Dukoski, who mm -hmm. uh, former uh, dean of the medical school at mm -hmm. UVA, mm -hmm. although that most of that work was done when he was still at University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Uh, PET imaging is uh, tricky. Very few hospitals have the equipment. It's expensive. And so there has been an ongoing effort to develop other diagnostic tools. Mm -hmm. And the first to come along was cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, which is acquired by spinal taps. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of really hard work has gone into proving that there are molecules that can be identified and measured in mm -hmm. terms of quantity in cerebrospinal fluid that correlate very well with the PET imaging results mm. and thus can replace PET imaging uh, or at least work in concert with PET imaging what to these, identify what are, patients. What are these molecules called? Well, the main ones are amyloid beta peptides, mm -hmm. which are the building blocks of the plaques, and the other is various forms of a protein called tau, uh, tau. as in the Greek letter, uh, and, and uh, tau is the building block of the neurofibrillary tangles, which are the other main abnormal structures that accumulate in Alzheimer's brain. 
Now, are the, do these molecules occur naturally in perfectly healthy brains? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but what happens in Alzheimer's disease is that, uh, at least in the case of amyloid beta, it misfolds and becomes toxic, and the brain makes it faster than the brain can get rid of it, mm -hmm. so it builds mm -hmm. up over time. And one of the manifestations of this that is, is, pla is plaque formation. Uh, in the case of tau, it, it, it's a similar thing. It's, it's a normal protein, very important. It misfolds. It becomes toxic. It tends to aggregate. And so levels of tau in the brain can build up over time also. But there's another advance that's much, much more exciting than pet, in, in my mind anyway. Right. So than, getting, a, getting your spinal tap sounds pretty complicated. It sounds painful. Yeah. So uh, interestingly, in, in North America, in the US and Canada, spinal taps are considered invasive, uh, right. risky procedures to be used only when really necessary. Mm -hmm. In Europe, for reasons I don't understand, it's much more routine. Huh. But all of that aside, we now have, we're now on the cusp of a new generation of diagnostics, and that's a simple blood test. Mm. And the fluid biomarkers that you can find in cerebrospinal fluid are also present in blood. Mm -hmm. And you can measure them in blood. And what's taken so long to get to that point is the fact that these biomarkers are present at maybe 1% the concentration uh, in blood at 1% the concentration as, the, as in CSF. Right. So the, the quantitative detection methods took many years to perfect. But we're now at the point, and I think by the end of this year, there will be FDA-approved blood tests for Alzheimer's disease oh, uh, that are just as accurate as PET imaging. And I think we can all appreciate the fact that uh, that's so much simpler than spinal taps or PET imaging. Right. Well, a blood test, that's, that's an ordinary visit to your lab after your annual checkup. A spinal tap, that sounds – that's a medical procedure. Exactly. Yeah. So um, – Am I to understand then that human trials are well underway or have wrapped up and are now the results are under review? Uh, uh, for, 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 the blood these, the blood for the blood test? Um, yeah, there's been an awful lot of uh, uh, you know, sort of basic science behind this. And mm -hmm. um, there is one, I believe there's one blood test that is being used. It doesn't require... FDA approval. It's oh, being uh -huh. used to mainly to monitor treatment efficacy for, right. you know, for, for experimental treatments. Right. There's a bioethical issue involved in using blood tests to identify people who are going to be symptomatic for Alzheimer's 10 or 15 years later. And that's quite simply, you know, if we knew how to help uh, you right. following that diagnosis, everybody would want to know. Right. But we don't th – this is the second part of the equation and I would argue that we're not there yet. We can tell you if you're going to be symptomatic down the road, but if the answer is yes, we don't know what to do for you yet. Right. So actually, I, I wanted to talk about that. So I have had conversations with friends who have said, qu quite frankly, well, I wouldn't want to know if I – uh, if 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 I was likely to get Alzheimer's, because there's nothing you can do about it, and you were you alluded to that just a moment ago, but but I really want to to discuss this as a scientist, not as a clinician, just as a scientist, or perhaps a family or a friend of someone who is struggling with Alzheimer's, or maybe even speaking for yourself. Why would we want to know if we are likely to develop Alzheimer's? How irreversible is the progress of this disease? So by the time you're symptomatic, mm -hmm. there's already massive irreversible brain damage. The best that we could hope for therapeutically at that point is to halt further disease progression. That may be achievable. The next best thing would be to slow progression. Mm -hmm. That's if you start treating people once they're symptomatic. Mm -hmm. okay? But the holy grail of, uh, uh, of the Alzheimer's field is to develop drugs that will... Uh, either prevent altogether or substantially delay symptom onset drugs that will be administered once a patient has been diagnosed with silent Alzheimer's disease, if you will, say, mm -hmm. through a blood test, mm -hmm. and knows that if they don't do anything 15 years down the road or so, uh, they'll start having cognitive failure. So what we're really... 
you know, the real challenge is to find drugs that can work that way. And a daunting challenge that is part of that problem is how many years would it take for a clinical trial to prove that a drug can work that way? Right. Uh, a lot of clinical trials just take, you know, months or a few years. We're talking about clinical trials that may take 8, 10, 12 right. years or longer, prohibitively expensive. You know, even the richest pharmaceutical firms are not going to invest. Mm. Well, I mean, they may invest, but they're not going to pay entirely for any such study because it's too risky and right. too expensive. Well, so... Are there specific candidates for drugs that we can talk about, drugs that perhaps mitigate synapse loss? You know, are there drugs? Well, uh, within the past couple of years, two drugs have been proved, uh, approved by the FDA. Mm -hmm. They're both monoclonal antibodies mm -hmm. against amyloid beta. They have to be administered uh, by injection every two or four weeks. Nobody knows for you know how many years do you have to do this. All of the clinical trials were based on uh, participants who already had a diagnosis of early Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment, which is exactly what the uh, words mean. It's a condition that precedes every case of full-blown Alzheimer's, but not every MCI case is a prelude to Alzheimer's. It could be a temporary condition or could lead to other, other conditions. But the point is that these antibodies that have been approved were only tested on people who were already fully you know, pretty far down the road. Right. An open question is, well, what if we use these same antibodies uh, for people who are diagnosed at as being at, at risk. risk based on, say, a blood test and begin treating them and treat them for 15 years? We just don't know the answer to that yet. Having said that, though, monoclonal antibodies are very expensive to produce. And as I mentioned, you have to go for frequent injections, mm -hmm. uh, you can't take it as a pill. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that may be, you know, well worth the trouble if they work. But my gut feeling is that when all is said and done, these antibodies are going to represent sort of the first generation of disease modifying drugs mm -hmm. uh, and that we're going to come up with better ones that are directed maybe at different targets and uh, can be taken in pill form. Mm. And uh, there's a, you know a, a lot of basic science and 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 early clinical trials and preclinical studies underway at labs all over the world trying to develop drugs like that. So turning to your lab, George, the Bloom Lab, it's 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 a major unit here at the University of Virginia. Can you tell us in some detail about what your lab is doing? Yeah, uh, let me let me address this drug. Discovery sure, sure. point first. Mm -hmm. So uh, a few years ago, we published a paper in Alzheimer's and Dementia, which is the official journal of the Alzheimer's Association. The first author was Aaron Kotis, who was a PhD student in my lab at the time. And the, the bottom line of that paper is that a drug called Memantin, uh, which is sold under the brand name Namenda mm -hmm. uh, and was approved by the FDA for treating moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, uh, this approval was in 2003, actually has disease-modifying properties. Mm. So when it was originally tested in clinical trials, it was on patients who were already symptomatic and it was so shown that- No, not even slowing the progression. Uh -huh. Temporary, mild- symptom relief, oh, okay? Okay, okay, masking the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And it had been thought until our work was done that memantin could not interfere with the processes that were leading to synapse decline and mm -hmm. neuron death. All it could do is mask the symptoms for a little while. Mm -hmm. But we showed, I, I think fairly convincingly, that it can interfere with the processes that lead to synapse loss and especially neuron death, and therefore might be disease modifying mm -hmm. if provided to patients early enough. And now that we know how to, now that we have these new biomarker studies, uh, that all becomes feasible. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, the Stanley E. Fulton Foundation has provided funds for two projects here at UVA ever mm -hmm. since. One was a pilot phase two clinical trial uh, for memantin as a as a prevention for Alzheimer's disease. So, what does phase two mean? So, uh, 
there are several phases in mm -hmm. clinical trials. Phase one is just safety. It involves 25, 30 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just want to make sure that, that this prospective drug is not poisonous. Harmful. Right, okay. right. Uh, we didn't have to do that with this drug because it's Came already gone through that. Right, yeah, right. Okay. And then uh, the next stage is, is phase two, which could be anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred patients where it's further looking into possible toxicity, but also looking for signs of efficacy. Okay. Right. So this trial is very small. We don't have enough participants to enable uh, really firm conclusions to be made in all likelihood. And it's also for a relatively short duration. Okay. So uh, they all, the, the Fulton Foundation also gave us uh, money and, and so th this money went to the Brain Institute, and I'm involved in that, but I'm not running the clinical trial. That's being done by Carol Manning, who's a mm -hmm. neuropsychologist and is director of the Memory Center at UVA Medical School. She's a professor of neurology. The Fulton Foundation also gave money to my lab to run a much more detailed study of memantin in transgenic mouse models of mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And we've now finished all the experiments. We're still working through the, uh, the uh, some of the data. Yeah. But what's clear is we this experiment was designed to test the hypothesis that if we begin treating the mice very early mm -hmm. instead of when they begin showing learning and memory decline, that the drugs will preserve their cognitive ability as they age. Uh, and we do that but with, with a variety of standard behavioral tests for mice. And that's exactly what we see. And furthermore, one more thing, uh, the memantin, the mice that are treated early but mm -hmm. not late with memantin, not only uh, is their behavior pretty much preserved, mm -hmm. but their plaque loads are reduced by 40% mm. by the time they're 18 months of age, which is a pretty old mouse. So, yeah, indeed. Um, I just want to rewind just a little bit for the mice, the, the mice that you study. Uh, how do you induce or how do you produce mice that are likely to develop Alzheimer's or Alzheimer-like like symptoms, right? There's well, no we, store yeah. where you can order online, right? Actually, there is. We buy oh, them from the Jack back. we buy them from the Jackson Laboratory. So these are how do they these are mice that have been genetically engineered to mimic in part human Alzheimer's disease. Mice don't get Alzheimer's naturally, probably because they just don't live long enough. Because ah. it takes a long time for all of this bad stuff that I described to actually happen. Animals that live longer, you know, dogs, cats, elephants, uh, parrots, you know, uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, mainly brain histology, that right. uh, that animals that can live a long time will develop plaques and oh, tangles, you know, so presumably they have Alzheimer's-like diseases also. So you need, the, the, the advantage of mice is uh, the genetics is well established. Timeline Their is- Timeline is short. Uh, they're they're cheap to maintain compared to larger animals, notwithstanding the fact that my lab spends about forty thousand dollars a year just housing mice. <laughs> oh, right. But you know, if we were talking about rats or dogs or something like that, it would be orders of magnitude more expensive. Sure. So mice mice are the primary preclinical animal models. So anyway, as a result of this new study showing that early but not late treatment works in mice. We're now more excited than ever about the possibility that memantin could have prophylactic activity right. against Alzheimer's disease. So one of our big goals is to raise enough money to expand the trial in terms of the number of participants and the duration of the trial so that we can achieve statistically significant data which hopefully will prove that in humans, it can be uh, uh, very helpful uh, in terms sure. of prevention. I don't think it's going to be a panacea, but right. I, think it, I, I think there's a really good chance that it, it could make a difference. And I, I think the long-term prospects for Alzheimer's drugs is drug cocktails, a mix of a few different drugs, each of which interferes with processes you know, pathogenic processes, very high upstream right. in the disease process. Right. It reminds me of HIV in the, in the 1980s, right? HIV diagnosis was the death sentence. Yes. But now it's just a chronic condition, right? It's, yes. It can be managed. It can be managed. That, I think, is an achievable goal for Alzheimer's disease, but we're not there yet. Well, George, thank you for sharing that. Now, 
there are many things that I want to talk about. Uh, our time is beginning to run short. But for members of the UVA community, this work is obviously very important. But could you give us sort of a, a verbal tour? A to what is it like to visit the the Bloom Lab? What are the day to day operations like? Who's in it? How could students get involved? What? Yeah. Well, tell look, us about it. It looks a lot like a lab. Okay, so <laughs> so we're in, we're in Gil and desktops. We're, well, and we're in Gilmer Hall, which was uh, recently renovated. So uh, in the old days, biomedical science labs were silos. You know, each group had its own walled enclosure that uh, segregated it from other labs. A newer model for labs, which is how the biology department and it is arranged now, is entire floors of buildings are shared by multiple labs. So it's a much more efficient use of space. Mm -hmm. So right now, my lab has about 10 people, uh, one graduate student who's being co-mentored with uh, Dr. Ali Guler, who's another uh, biology professor. Mm -hmm. I have uh, several PhD level scientists, some undergraduates, a few technicians, and very interestingly, Horst Walrabi, an 85-year-old gentleman who until about 25 years ago was president of Bayer Pharmaceutical North America wow. Division in Connecticut. And when he retired from Bayer, he and his wife moved to Charlottesville. Uh, they thought it'd be a nice place to live. And he decided that he that would give him an opportunity to do what he really wanted to do for a long time, which was forget about the business of science. He wanted to get his hands wet in oh, the he lab. Wanted to he put volunteered. On the white this was yeah. a couple of years before uh -huh. I came here. He started working with another lab in the biology department. And uh, when that faculty member left to go elsewhere, he moved over to my lab and he's been working there ever since. So he loves the yeah. pipettes and yeah. the test yeah. tubes and okay. Yeah, he actually just does very high end light microscopy. Uh huh. So, uh, you know, as far as opportunities for other UVA people, we always have several undergrads working in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, at this moment, uh, I think we're saturated as far as that goes, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to discourage any undergrad who might be interested sure. uh, uh, from contacting me. Well, you are part of the Brain Institute, which yes. is a large consortium. Yes. So um, uh, maybe you could speak a bit about what it's like to be part of the Brain Institute and maybe describe some of the initiatives that are going on there. It's a major investment from the university. Yeah, well, I think it's a wonderful investment. You know, it's the um, um, umbrella for everything neuroscience in UVA. So UVA has a very strong, deep neuroscience faculty scattered among many departments, clinical and, and schools. basic science yeah. and schools. Medical so we're school, talking right, about, right. you know, biology, psychology, chemistry in the college, right. neuroscience, neurology, and pharmacology primarily in the medical school, right, right. even in the in the school of education and in the engineering right. school. And so the Brain Institute is the umbrella for all of neuroscience at, at UVA. It has its own funding. And I think, you know, maybe the best way to describe it from my perspective is it, it 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 works synergistically with the individual departments to advance the cause of neuroscience um, at the university, and part of its budget is devoted to uh, starter grants, internal grants right. that are given every year and have helped to jumpstart. Uh, a lot of projects that otherwise would not have been able to get off the ground and in many cases lead eventually to uh, major funding from NIH or private foundations or both. Yeah. Well, our time is about up, George. One last question, and, and I like to ask this question of all of our guests. I'd like our guests to talk about their personal stories, right? How did you come to be a distinguished scientist here at the University of Virginia? As a kid, were you thinking... I definitely want to go into medical research or you know, what's, your, what's your story? How'd you get here? So I think I always wanted to be a biologist and I'm not sure why, but maybe because my father instilled in me a love of bird watching when I was young. Oh. And uh, Did he do uh, an annual bird count? No, he was not a very good identifier of birds oh. himself. He just liked to look at them, but oh, okay. I, I kind of got caught up in it. And as I got older, I really didn't Maybe since grad school, I d didn't really do much about it. But then uh, a handful of years ago, I started getting into it again. So I'm an avid birder <laughs> okay. again. So that was, I, I think I always knew I wanted to be a biology major in college, which I was at University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And and 
Uh, most of my work there was, uh, my, my main interest was sort of traditional biology. In fact, I think I wanted to be an ornithologist. Okay? Oh, okay. Uh, but as fate would have it, I had to take this course. Um, I remember it was first or second year, it was Biology 300 at Penn, uh, Cell and Molecular Biology. I had no interest in it at all, but I knew I had to take it to be a biology major. And it was transformative in my <laughs> thinking. Uh -huh. And so I ended up going to grad school uh, also at Penn, but in, in a cell biology mm -hmm. uh, lab. And these days, I think of myself as, as a cell biologist masquerading as a neuroscientist. I never had any mm -hmm. formal mm -hmm. training in neuroscience, uh, but just a little less than half of my career uh, as an independent scientist, which began at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas and then extended at least a few years here at UVA, my lab was really focusing on basic cell biology, how mm -hmm. cells move from place to place, mm -hmm. how they divide, how things are transported from one place to another inside the cell. But a lot of that work, believe it or not, was done in the context of, of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was at, in Texas, every summer I would spend a couple of months at Woods Hole, Massachusetts at the uh, Marine Biological Laboratory working on what's called fast axonal transport in squid giant axons. Wow. And retrospectively, that was a big part of, of, of my interest in Alzheimer's disease. Another w was while I was at UT Southwestern, I became interested in discovering the building blocks what are the proteins that make the neurofibrillary tangles in mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease? Mm -hmm. And I was interested in that because the tangles are bundles of filaments mm -hmm. uh, and there are all sorts of other filaments in cells like microtubules and actin filaments, which I had been studying for years. And so I had a plan to figure out what the building blocks of the tangles were. Uh, but I, to do the work, I, I, I needed the cooperation of a neurologist uh, or a pathologist to give me brain Access, tissue right, from right. Uh, Alzheimer's patients, and I couldn't get them to cooperate. And then somebody else figured out what the answer is, and the answer was tau. Uh. But I was bitten by the bug, and we gradually did a few things, even at UT Southwestern, germane to Alzheimer's disease. And when I moved here to UVA, one of my goals was to transition the lab, uh, however long it took, uh, from the basic cell biology that we were doing to the cell biology of Alzheimer's disease. And maybe the best way to describe the philosophy of my research program is we're trying to figure out what happens at the very beginning mm -hmm. to convert a normal, healthy neuron into an Alzheimer's neuron, and how can we leverage the information that we learn to translation in the clinic? Wow. George, I didn't, certainly didn't expect that. So if, if I go back to your website and review your publications early on, there'll be articles about Squid brains? Yeah. It, it, yeah. You, you can have, it, the first many, many years, there's nothing about Alzheimer's disease or wow. tell. <laughs> well, you know, the best scientists follow their passion. The curiosity leads to the next questions. And in your case, leads to one of the most difficult health challenges facing us all. So, George, thank you very much for this conversation. It's been, it's been a delight. George, your contributions to UVA, Alzheimer's. It's all extraordinary and inspiring. It's a perfect example of President Ryan's vision for the university to be great and good in everything we do. So on behalf of UVA, thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being here. I'm Ken Ono, STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum professor of mathematics. And you've been listening to Who's in STEM. Who's in STEM is a production of WTJU 91.1 FM and the Office of the Provost at the University of Virginia. Who's in STEM is produced by Katherine Kossaboom, Claire Curzan, Rhea Verma, Mary Garner McGee, and Ariane Ballou. Our music is composed and performed by Robert Schneider and John Ferguson of Apples and Stereo. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Listen and subscribe to Who's in STEM on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with another conversation about scientific technological innovation at the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm.